and even this morning to, to bring the offering of worship through communion at the end of our service. It's just kind of like all building toward that climax. But let's open our Bibles to the Gospel by John chapter 14. And what I would like to this morning and, and uh, probably next week and maybe the week after is underline in your mind what was one of the central doctrines of the early church. Uh, what was the heartbeat that caused them, uh, whenever you think about, whatever your picture is of the ancient church, whether it's the arena or the catacombs or the fearless soul winning and spread of the gospel, their resilience to the point that you couldn't kill them fast enough, more people were getting saved, the faster they were liquidating the believers. Uh, as one of the historians put it, the blood of the martyrs became the, the seed from which the church grew. Whatever view of the early church you have in your mind, what we're looking at this morning was across the board the zeal that those people shared. And it was based on a doctrine. Remember, if you believe right, you'll behave right. If, if you believe this central truth that Christ taught and that each of the apostles began to build upon and expand upon the truth through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that is, is what caused the, the dynamism, the, the power of the early church. The tragedy is that what I'm sharing this morning is scorned by more than half of all the people that call themselves Christians and misunderstood by the majority of the rest, even though it's at the very heart of the scriptures, even though it's not something that, that is obscure, it's what Jesus himself taught, the early church embraced, and those followers lived with passion. And what I'm talking about is, the topic this morning is the rapture according to Jesus. You see, the, the doctrine Jesus taught was changed in the fourth century by St. Augustine for political reasons. And Augustinian theology, which is what amillennialism and a lot of our modern churches are based on today, was made to keep Christians from having this view that, that it really didn't matter how nice your house and gardens and bank account were because we're citizens of heaven and we're not going to be here very long. And the earth is very temporary and heaven and earth is going to pass away. But where we're going is going to last forever. And Augustine didn't want that. And he, as a church father, began this, this concept that the church has replaced Israel as the center of God's focus and that the kingdom is here. And so that you build the biggest, that's where Byzantine churches, I, I take people all over the world showing them the Byzantium, and, and the huge churches were an expression of Augustinian here, and you're the kingdom, and the kingdom started already at the cross, and you're living in it and conquered the earth. And what has happened since the fourth century to the church? It's institutionalized, and it's basically powerless, except for a few glowing segments. And it's all because the doctrine Jesus taught was abandoned by Augustine, picked up by Calvin, and promoted through Jonathan Edwards to this very day. You hear it today, this concept that that's all mysterious. We're not worried about this any moment return of Christ. We're supposed to be doing the kingdom, and this is the kingdom. It's not. And Jesus said so. So look at John 14 with me because... Jesus taught such a comforting, hope-filled message of his return to rescue his church before the tribulation that his disciples, those who knew Jesus and were trained by him, went everywhere teaching the same truth. In fact, when Paul only had a month to speak in a pagan town, a church plant in a port city that a Roman historian described as a cesspool, now, Roman culture in the first century with a, a brazenly flaunting homosexual emperor who, who paraded about Florus, his male castrated slave wife, as his object of devotion, and, and all of the rest of the wickedness of the Roman Empire, one historian from the first century called it a cesspool. Well, Paul went and built an island floating in a cesspool. He planted a church in Thessalonica. And he only had three sure weeks to teach him, and we think maybe three more. 
because he left the synagogue and stayed a while longer. So he probably lasted a little more than a month teaching there. Do you know what was central? What appears in every chapter of First Thessalonians and Second? The doctrine of the any moment return Jesus instituted. Darby didn't institute it. Walver didn't institute it. Tim left behind LaHaye, didn't think of it. And neither did Hal Lindsey. Jesus brought this up. So what's interesting is, with so much of Christendom fighting something, Jesus invented, taught. And in our text, when we get to it in Revelation 3, he said, when I declare and open the door to something, no one can shut it, hard as they might try. Jesus is the originator. The rapture was first taught by Jesus. The rapture is a doctrine started and taught by Jesus, continued and spread by his disciples, believed and passionately lived out by the church. And the early church heard and understand this doctrine. And what is the doctrine? Simply stated, Jesus says, I am going to prepare a place for you, and when it's ready, I'm coming to get you. And what he said is a completely different track he had for his believers, his followers, his church, than the stated program he had for the end of the world, which is all based on Israel, Jerusalem, and horrific plagues, demon hordes that are so bad that when Jesus was casting demons out in Mark 5, the demons pled with him, don't put us in the pit where all those things are you're going to let out someday to, to just run havoc through the earth. Don't put us in there. Put us anywhere, but don't put us in there. I mean, the demons don't even like what's coming, and they're demons. It's amazing to think about that Jesus said to his church, everything I've taught publicly about how the world's going to end, you're not going through that. I'm going to come for you. Jesus was the first to teach about the rapture, and so those who listened to him James, Jesus' earthly brother, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, the very first writing inspired New Testament writer, wrote in James chapter 5. You know how he postured all of his, his criticisms of their greed and their, their insensitivity to the poor? Do you know what he said? Jesus is standing right outside the door. He's going to come at any moment. Is that how you're supposed to be a businessman? In light of him being right outside the door? As it says in James 5, 7, he's standing ready to open the door. Don't live that way. You see, they caught what Jesus taught. On after him, the Apostle Paul, writing the second book of the New Testament, second earliest book of the New Testament, which is the the epistle to the Thessalonians, said, Jesus Christ shines from every rapture-induced, hope-filled, expectant chapter of this book. First Thessalonians 1, 9, and 10 talks about the one who is saving you from the wrath to come. Chapter 2, 19, and 20, the whole purpose of life is who are you going to take at the coming of Christ with you? In other words, the only thing we can take to heaven are people. Chapter 3, verse 13, live blamelessly. You don't know when he's going to open the door and walk in on you. Live for him. Chapter 4, he says, don't even worry about those who have preceded you in death because he's going to raise those first, and we're going to all be caught up together with him in the clouds. Clouds. And that's how Jesus left. You see, all the little pieces of what Jesus said when he declared this doctrine are played out in the inspired writings of those who followed. So Paul's epistles are flavored, they're seasoned from start to finish in half of the New Testament that he wrote with a focused life awaiting Christ. That's just how the people heard the gospel. I mean, we... Christendom today, if you told someone that a part of the doctrine for new believers was the, the any moment return of Christ, that, that would be run out on a rail in more than half of all churches in America with believers in them because they don't believe that, even though Jesus taught it and the Bible contains it. The reason is, and someone asked me about this, they said, how does that work? I said, well, you have two choices. Either you can let God's word correct your system, or you can use your system to filter God's word and and make the pieces fit according to your system. So either your system that some were born with, you know, there's a whole multitude of people 
that we're born into a tradition that Augustine started, Calvin continued, and Knox took one way in the Presbyterian Church, and, and it went another way through Calvin out of Geneva, and, and that whole amillennial interpreting of Scripture, which is wrong, period, has led them to not be able to look at the Bible straight. It's just like the Catholic Church chaining the Latin Bible to the altar and not letting the people read it, lest they learn something. The system chains people from ever just reading the Bible. They've got to, they've got to fit in the system rather than just letting the plain sense of Scripture speak as we see Jesus speaking. Well, Paul ends his epistles in 2 Timothy 4 talking about his crown at that day when Jesus comes, and he says, I don't want anything to cause me to lose that crown, so I'm going to run a race looking onto Jesus, and he is the one that I don't want to get disqualified from the race for because I, and Paul thought Christ was coming in his time. You know what he said? Not then those who are alive and remain. He said then what? We who are alive and remain are going to be caught up with him. You say, how could Paul possibly believe that? Because that's what Jesus said. That was the hope. They called it the blessed hope of the early church. Peter says the same thing. He goes so far as asking, what kind of a life should you live because you know already the future? Jesus has written the future. You know he's going to come, and you know that, that he's going to dissolve and burn everything up. Did you know that we're living on a temporary planet by a whole bunch of people that want to make it last forever? And they're willing to cut population. They're willing to murder millions of children every year just so that there aren't too many people around here wrecking the planet. And Jesus said, this planet is very short-lived and it's going to pass away. In fact, this earth, if you believe the Bible, is somewhere in the range of six to 8,000 years old, period. You say, uh-uh, millions, billions, hundreds of thousands. No, that's evolutionary lies. You can't get millions and billions out of the Bible. You only get it when you have a system that makes you want to put it in the Bible. But it's not in the Bible, it's a temporary planet. And Jesus said over and over, heaven and earth are going to pass away. John the Apostle, not only wrote 22 chapters for Christ in Revelation, but his epistles are filled with the same. He says in his first epistle, chapter 3, that, that our hope, what hope is that? that we're going to endure when they open the pit, when God lets all those things out, we're going to miss it? Uh, you know, we're going to hide in some bunker and miss it? No, the hope is that Jesus promised we wouldn't be here when God does that. Jesus himself said that. Jesus said, my church will not be preserved through the tribulation. They will be ek tereo, Greek word ek, out of, tereo, kept. Guarded from ever being in. Jesus said, the great tribulation. Jesus said, Dallas Seminary didn't say that. Jack Van Empey didn't say that. They might have repeated it. Jesus said that. And that's the conflict that people in their minds need to decide on. Are you going to believe something because your grandfather believed it and their great-grandfather because they were looking through a grid and refused to accept the plain teaching of the Bible? Are you going to believe it because Jesus said it? That's the choice every generation has. In Revelation 3, we're going to see a little later, Jesus identified himself to the church in Philadelphia, and, and when he gave the, the greatest teaching on this event called the rapture, Jesus identified himself, as we've been seeing in the last two weeks, as the one who's talking to you, telling you this hard-to-believe, incredible tr doctrine is true. So he'll always tell the truth. He's holy. He has an unstoppably messianic key of David, and when Jesus speaks and tells the truth, we should listen and hear him and hear what he says so we can have confident assurance knowing that he knows what he's talking about. Isn't that amazing? People try and say, well, I'm not sure if you know, Jesus really implied that. He is the one that brought it up. He is the one that taught it. And he is the one that affirmed it at the end. Well, Jesus taught repeatedly about his second coming. He taught in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 that his second coming was to judge the ungodly. Boy, the apostles picked up on that too. 
Peter, or Paul says when he comes, he's going to come with flaming fire, burning and consuming and destroying as he comes down. It says that, that the sword of his mouth is going to cause there to be so much blood that, that there, it's going to be a gathering of all the carrion, all the, the, the scavenger creatures. They're all going to come because they're going to feast. I mean, it's real gross. It'd make a great you know, Stephen King movie or something, you know, or novel. It's so horrific. That's how Jesus said his second coming was. He said that in Matthew 24, he said that in Mark 13, he said that in Luke 21. However, every time he taught those sermons in the future, every one, the setting of the sermon was the context of Israel. The focus of the sermon was upon the Jews. The, the center was Jerusalem, and the affected parties were Israel. See, that's how Jesus taught the future. He taught a second coming in fiery, bloody. In fact, he said, when I show up at the second coming, my pure white garments are going to be splattered with blood from all the killing that I'm doing. It's not a real pleasant picture. It's certainly not hopeful if you're on that side of the coming. So, the rapture Jesus taught is not the second coming. When Jesus spoke to believers, as we see in John 14, verses 1 through 3, his emphasis was completely different. Jesus taught of a coming for his own born-again children of the faith, and he taught them three bedrock truths about the rapture or his personal coming for his own. These truths are that the rapture will be a source of comfort, and it will be, it'll be similar to his ascension. And, and the rapture, Jesus said, is going to be an intentional rescue. And you see, it's not systematic theologians that have created rapture teaching. Jesus gave those three points. That is the biblical heart of the doctrine that completely captivated and motivated the early church. And they evangelized common people without mission organizations and without huge fundraising structures and without all the media and electronic, everything. Common people fanned out to every corner of the earth because they knew that's what they were left to do. They knew he was right outside the door. And when he opened the door, they wanted to be doing what he left them to do. It was very simple. I think they could all catch it the first service. It wasn't, it wasn't cumbered down with, with layers of, well, obviously it couldn't mean that, teaching. They just heard it and believed it. It's amazing. These truths taught by Jesus Christ himself constitute the biblical doctrinal basis for all that the early church was later taught by the apostles, which extends throughout all the centuries since Christ's ministry. So, this morning, just as introduction, I'd like to show you the three foundational truths the rapture taught by Christ. Number one, right where you are, John 14. If you look in your Bible at these foundational truths, I would assume that if you just look, if, if you just look and, and for just this service, pull the grid back and just look at what the Bible says. I don't think there's anything in these three verses that, that I'm going to read that you can disagree with. Now, your system can, but the Bible can't. Or the speaker in the Bible, Jesus, can't, because this is what he taught. Number one, Jesus said the rapture would be a source of comfort. Look at John 14. In John 14, Jesus promises he's coming for us, and that coming is to take us to a place in his Father's house he's personally prepared for us. So whatever it is Jesus is talking about, he is posturing his coming as being a comforting taking home to a special place. Now look at his words. Look at John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why were they troubled? Well, do you know this is Thursday night of the last week of Christ's life. It started out with a bang on Sunday. Jesus marches into town and everyone takes their coats off and throws them on the ground. They lay all those palm branches. He gets on the, the colt never ridden on and people start fulfilling Zechariah 9, 9. Well, they already know the end of Zechariah is the kingdom is coming and the king obliterates all the armies of the world. And they thought it was happening then. 
Everyone got so excited. They started saying, Hosanna, which is save us now. And, and, and they are just so excited. And that was on Sunday. On Monday, Jesus curses the temple, drives all the money changers out, and basically says, I'm through with you, Israel. I'm through with your temple. You were supposed to be a, a, a missionary to the whole world. You were supposed to go out with the good news of the one God to the nations. You were supposed to allow them to come and meet me in the temple, and you haven't done it. He cursed them. Boy, did that disappoint the disciples. So they, they said, could you please, I mean, yesterday, today, so he sits down on the side of the Mount of Olives and preaches a prophetic sermon, Matthew 24. And in Matthew 24, he says that he is going to come in blinding light and he is going to come and he's going to be harvesting and throwing people into the furnace. And he goes through all the details. And they got really sad because at the end he says, and the Son of Man is going to die. And they couldn't put it together. King on Monday, or Sunday ruined the temple on Monday, and on Tuesday, you're going to die? So it's Thursday night. And he says to him, oh, don't let your heart be troubled. Verse 1 of John 14, this is before, uh, before they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is in the context of communion, which is chapter 13 of John's Gospel. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Boy, there's an unfortunate translation. Whatever your Bible says, the word doesn't mean mansions. I mean, it doesn't mean the $3 million house that just burned over on Bronson Drive a few weeks ago. It doesn't mean Beverly Hills. It doesn't mean, you know, that kind of stuff. This is the same word that, that in the Old Testament, in Genesis 6 through 8, when God instructs Noah to build an ark, he said, and, and make in it a place for every creature that, that I send to your ark. God sent every, two by two and, and uh, uh, seven clean and, and one pair of, you know, the whole ark parade. There was a spot for every one of them that Noah built. The Greek word is this, the very same word. It isn't mansion. Can you imagine, a, you know, some little, uh, you know, parakeet being in a mansion, it was in something just for it, you know. It, it was a little nest for it. And what the Lord says is, I'm, I'm making a, a nest, a little, a, a spot in my Father's house just for you. You're going to be not, you know, I got a mansion just over the hilltop, you know, somewhere down Glory Boulevard. No, no, you're staying in the main house, you know, with the Lord. I go to prepare that place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, and he's talking to those believers, those disciples, those who were hanging, I mean, they've already heard his prophetic sermon. They already know he's coming to destroy everybody that's marching on Jerusalem, and he's already told them what's going to happen. And that, that just shook them. So he says, oh, but that's not my plan for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I get done preparing your place for you, I will come again. And this exactly fits with everything Jesus said. Because when he comes again, he comes with 10,000 times 10,000 of his saints, it says in the book of Jude. The earliest prophecy of the second coming is in the book of Jude by Enoch, seventh from Adam. Enoch saw the second coming as Jesus, the King of Kings, coming with all the saints already with him. Not resurrecting them, reconstituting them, and, and you know, dressing them and getting them up there. That's, they are already clothed and coming from somewhere. The somewhere is right here. I will come again. That, that is what he's talking about. He's talking about a coming that is for them. And, he said, and who is he talking to? He's talking to the believers. He's talking to those who are the founders, the planters, the, the, the ones he used to, to start his church. I will come again and receive you to myself 
that where I am, there you may be also. I'm going to, to re change your address. I'm going to remove you from where you are and move you in with me. A completely different event is when he gathers all those from his banquet, which is how we see it in Revelation 19. They're already in heaven. They're already at the banquet. They're already in their father's house. They're already celebrating what Jesus said he would never celebrate again. Did you know communion we're celebrating this morning? Jesus lets it pass by. He doesn't celebrate until we all get home to the banquet. And when we get home and we celebrate that banquet, he steps up from the table and says, we've got to go, time to go, and we all come back with him at the second coming. That's how Jesus taught it. And that's the rapture according to Jesus. Well, Jesus here makes the first and most powerful declaration of the, of the blessed hope every believer across every century of his church is to partake in. Now, look at Luke. Back up a book, okay, Luke 24. Here's the second time he talks about it. It's in Luke 24. So the three foundational truths, number one, Jesus said the rapture will be a source of comfort. I mean, if you can't get that up, John 14, 1 through 3, then you're not reading it. He said, I'm going to come again, and it's going to be a comfort to you. No matter what your system is, that's what it says. Number two, Jesus said the rapture, secondly, this, this coming for his own. Rapture means him coming for his own. It's going to be similar to his ascension. Well, what was Jesus' ascension like? Jesus tells him he's coming back the same way he left his disciples as is recorded in Luke 24. And starting in verse 50, if you read with me, you're going to see it was secretly, comfortingly, and raining blessings down upon them. That's how Jesus left. And he said, the next time I come to this earth, that's how I'm coming. That's why you can't call what Jesus is going to do for his church the second coming. Because that, that is code. The second coming is for the fiery indignation, burning and consuming in judgment. Look, look how he left. Luke 24, verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now, the word blessing is not this. Notice that's silent. The word blessing is he was talking, and he was saying things to them. He lifted up his hands, and he was literally showering them. You know, if you ever go, we used to go on the Parade of Homes things, and they had these neat showers that they called it a, I don't know what they call it, but it's got this, it looks like a tropical rainforest thing. You know those houses, we all walk through them. You pay $12 to go through a million dollar house you never would want to buy or pay the taxes on. But they used to have these giant walk-in showers with these rainforest showers. That's the picture of Jesus when he was blessing them. He was just showering them with these words of blessing. So, he led them out as far as Bethany, verse 50, and he lifted up his hands and he starts speaking and, and out comes this shower of blessings. Verse 51, now it came to pass while, and it's still an audible sound, he's still talking. This blessing is not him lifting up his hands silently. He's talking. He's looking down at them. He's radiantly smiling down on them and he is speaking all these blessings to them. You can just imagine, you know how when you stand, like sometimes the music is just, it just so touches our hearts that we just stand there and tears of joy, you just experience the truth. Can you imagine what it would be like not to be singing off a screen but to have Jesus running the shower, the words falling down on us. And so they're standing there and here come all these blessings and while he was blessing them, he was parted from them. Now in my mind, you know, I have a phonographic mind. That means what I'm thinking about. I talk about phono, talk. And so I can see this, that, that they're just kind of like sometimes we get, while we're singing, we're going, crown him now with many crowns, and we're closing our eyes, and all of a sudden they're noticing that the words that they're hearing are moving. They heard Jesus, and he's talking to him, and he's kind of like standing there, and all of a sudden they thought it sounded like it was going up, and all of a sudden they, they hear it's moving, and so they open their eyes, and oh, he's rising. I mean, He'd never done that one before. I mean, he's just going like that. That's what, look what verse 51 says. While he was speaking these blessings, he was lifted up from them and carried up into heaven. Wow. Okay, real quickly, go to Acts chapter 1. Too bad that they stuck John between there because actually Acts 24 is, is boom, connected. It's just a continuation. And it's nice to read Luke and Acts together because it just, the story goes on unbrokenly. So go from Luke 24, 51 to Acts 1, verse 9, and it's right at the same moment. 
He was parted from them and carried up into heaven. That's what Luke 24, 51 says. Now look at Acts 1, verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Okay, now, we're looking at an event. We're looking at how Jesus left the earth. Why are we looking at that? Because look, look what it says in verse 10. While they look steadfastly toward heaven, now they've got their eyes open. They're looking straight up at this cloud that's vanishing from their sight. And they're, they're just in awe and still thinking about all those words he was saying and just basking it. Now they hear more voices. And it brings them back to reality. And they look down, there's two people that hadn't been there before standing, verse 11, uh, or verse 10, stood by them in white apparel, and they said to him, verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Now here is the essence. This same Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will so come, Jesus said, I'm coming, remember Matthew 14? I'm coming to get you. Now the angels are, are explaining and helping and fitting together what Jesus has taught them. This same Jesus who was taken up from him to heaven will so come. It would be nice if they just said, we'll come. We wouldn't have any dispute. There wouldn't be half of Christendom not believing one of the greatest doctrines in the Bible. But look what they add. In like manner as you saw him go into heaven. How did he go? Jesus ascended up with outstretched and uplifted hand, blessing them as he rose out of sight. Now, wait a minute. How come the temple guard didn't arrest him? Why didn't Pilate send over a contingent? Why didn't the high priest finally get him and put a chain on him this time instead of just sealing him in a tomb? How come nothing happened? Because after Christ's resurrection, he was only seen by believing eyes. He was only touched by loving hands. If you think about it, some would say, ah, how are we sure he wasn't a ghost? That's why John says, what we've seen and heard and handled with our hands was manifest. He, he had a real body. Remember, the disciples touched him. Uh, Thomas did more than touch him. He stuck his hand, felt the, the deep fissure of the horrific wounds that Jesus had. So he was real, all right, but he withheld himself from being seen by any unbeliever. The, the, the return of Jesus to heaven was secret, it was comforting, and it was a blessing, but only for believers. Now look what, what is said. Again, he was taken up, a cloud received another sight, verse 9. The, the two in white apparel said in verse 11, the same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus said, the rapture is going to be just like my ascension to heaven. What did he mean by that? It's going to be only for believers. It's going to be one of the most blessed moments of their life. In fact, did you know they caught this? Do you know what the early church, without theologians to cloud their mind, do you know what the early church called this event of Christ's coming? The blessed hope. Why? Because they were hoping at any moment that, that that shower of blessings of his words would come down upon them and he'd say, I have gone to prepare a place for you and now I'm coming to take you unto myself. Okay, the third one. And here's the last one. And we're almost time for communion. Go to Revelation 3. And this is our... Actually, all this was introduction for our scripture that we're going to read this morning, okay? Uh, Jesus said thirdly in Revelation 3, the rapture will be an intentional rescue. An intentional rescue. Don't ever forget that. Jesus promises as the true one, he's coming back before the end of the world to keep us from the tribulation. When Jesus introduces himself in Revelation 3, 7, he was explaining how he can offer this blessed hope, one of the greatest, one of the most amazing promises ever made to those precious and faithful saints who, by the way, believed it and lived every moment of their life like he was outside the door and any moment coming in, and it caused them to endure the Colosseum and the flames of the stake and the horrors of dank, dark prisons because they believed that at any moment, He's going to come. 
and they just embraced that truth. They, like us, lived in an uncertain world, and more than any other church to the Philadelphians, Jesus explains his power in a way we can grasp. The blessed hope is what Jesus promised to his own. And that blessed hope isn't just, it's a comfort, and it isn't just, it's just like his ascension. The blessed hope has an element, and this is the hardest one for people that don't believe this, even though it's in the Bible, they don't believe it. It's an intentional rescue. That's what Jesus said. The context of the rapture, according to Jesus, comes after a series of titles, and we looked at those for two weeks. Now look at the promised rapture given to the church by Jesus, who's already introduced himself in verse 7 as the truth, the Holy One, the one who holds the key, the one who is unstoppable. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 10. So let's stand for the reading of God's word, and then we're going to go soon into communion, so don't worry, we're still having it. Okay, look at Revelation 3, verse 10. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour. What is that, will keep you? Two little words, ek tereo. Ek means out of. Um, if you dropped your iPhone in the dishwasher, you wouldn't hold it under the water and say, I'm going to protect you through the dishwater. You would grab it because you don't want to lose several hundred dollars. You would jerk it out of there. You would snatch it. In fact, if you were dropping it and it was falling that way, you'd grab it so it wouldn't even go in. That's ek, out of. Not through, not put a baggie around it and keep it safe. Out of, not even in. Tereo means to guard. So Jesus said, I'm guarding you, I'm watching you, I'm keeping my eye on the clock, I know everything going on, and I'm going to keep you out of something. Okay, what is he keeping us out of? Keep reading in verse 10. The hour of trial. If that's all it said, we would have no idea what he's talking about. It could have been that, you know, there was some meanie in town that was persecuting him. But notice what he said. The hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. By the way, that's what most of the book of Revelation is about. And this is, this is right in sequence looking at chapter 6 to 19. The hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world. And he tells the truth. He doesn't exaggerate. Well, if we didn't understand it, it's going to test those. So the purpose of whatever he's keeping them from is a test to those who are earth dwellers. If you read Revelation, always that term is used for the lost rebels, the ungodly that, that hate God. He says, you, I'm coming for you. I'm going to ectoreo you. I'm going to guardedly keep you out of. You're not even going to be in the hour of trial, which shall come on the whole world to test the earth dwellers. And then he says in verse 11, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. He overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He'll go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven. If you notice, if you're just reading this, he's following exactly the pattern of the book of Revelation. He's talking about the hour of trial, 6 to 19. He's talking about Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. That's in chapter 21. Jesus is just sinking with what this framework that he gave us. And I will write on him my new name, verse 13, he who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the little church in Philadelphia. No. The last word is churches. The rapture was invented by Jesus as a comfort, as, as a picture to remind us of how he left the earth. He's coming back. But the biggest piece of it is it's an intentional rescue. And you know what Jesus said? And that's how we're going into communion. He said at the Last Supper, he says, I'm not going to partake in communion again until every one of you are safely seated at the communion service I'm leading in heaven. And that's in chapter 19 of Revelation. His second coming is four verses after that banquet. So either you believe Jesus or you believe the grid I tell you, it's wonderful just to believe Jesus. Let's bow for a word of prayer. 
We're going to prepare our hearts, and if the men would go and prepare to serve as communion, we're going to start right after this. Father in heaven, I pray that we would realize that your promise through Jesus to us is to comfort us all of our days, that you're standing outside the door, and we don't know when you're going to step in. And you're going to come and step in in blessing, reigning upon us, the place you prepared for us, taking us home for communion at a banquet with, with your redeemed and blood-bought saints. But it's intentional when you do it to rescue us from chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. That trial that will come on all the earth dwellers. And I pray that you would stir in our hearts as you stirred in the early church a holy expectancy that we would look and long for you. Thank you for the bread that pictures your body bearing our sin as the offering, the atoning sacrifice to take away the penalty and presence of your wrath against our sin forever. Thank you for the bread. Bless us as we worship you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be 